is full of people willing to give their own interpretation as to the meaning of the word Armageddon. For instance, in 1961, former U.S. President Eisenhower said that the growing nuclear threat put Chicago but 30 minutes from Armageddon. Henry Kissinger, former U.S. Secretary of State, wrote, No previous generation of statesmen has had to conduct policy in so unknown an environment at the borderline of Armageddon. Even religious officials have put their own interpretation into the cauldron. The personal secretary to John Paul II stated, The Pope is like a spiritual Hercules trying to keep the superpowers apart, trying to avert nuclear Armageddon. Hollywood produces a film, a million dollar blockbuster, concerning an asteroid that crashes through the atmosphere and wipes out life on this planet. They call the film Armageddon. But these, these are just mere human thoughts. If we want to know what the word Armageddon means, we have to go to a higher source of information. We have to turn to the book that originally uses the word Armageddon in the context that we're going to discuss today. The book God's Word, the Bible. May we encourage everyone to open it right now to Revelation chapter 16. And if we have a marker, it would be wise to place it here, because we will be referring back to Revelation 16 on a number of occasions today. So, what is Armageddon? We'll take a look. Verses 14 and 16. There, John recorded, they are in fact expressions inspired by demons and perform signs and they go forth to the kings of the entire inhabited earth to gather them together to the war of the great day of God the Almighty and also verse 16 and they gathered them together to the place that is called in Hebrew Armageddon now, what is it speaking about? It's not talking about a location in the Middle East. It is talking about a global situation. The word literally means a mountain of assembly of troops. But as we will see in our discussion today, scripturally it's speaking about the climax of Jehovah God's great day. Who are the participants in this battle? Well, verse 14 point them out for us. On the one side, you have Satan, bringing together the nations of this earthly society. And on the other, well, Jehovah's side is represented by his son, Jesus Christ, the enthroned messianic king, leading a vast angelic army. But what will this battle achieve? Well, let's just clarify a great misunderstanding that is popular in the world today. Armageddon will not destroy the planet earth there are no indicators of that in the bible in fact the indicators are all to the opposite just think about it jehovah put a great deal of time energy and intelligence into designing this planet to sustain life we are constantly finding out things that marvelous concerning the the oxygen cycle, the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, all these different things, the complexity of life on this planet, Job's not going to wipe it out. The planet Earth has not done anything wrong, deserving of destruction. It is the wicked people on the planet Earth who will be wiped out at this battle of Armageddon. Armageddon must be fought because Jehovah God, as the universal sovereign and the creator of the earth, is its owner. He alone has the right to say what form of government will have dominion over his planet. And basically, it does not matter one iota what other people think. Jehovah alone is the one who is judging. He is the one who will bring about the end result that he has decided will come. Anybody who does not willingly accept 
the righteous, fair, and just rulership of the messianic king, Jesus Christ, is either a rebel, a squatter, or a vandal, and they will not be allowed to continue on God's planet for much longer. Their attitude, well, is perfectly described in the second psalm, verses 2 through 6, I'll quote, where the, the psalmist said, The kings of the earth take their stand, and high officials themselves have massed together as one against Jehovah and against his anointed one, saying, Let us tear their bands apart and cast their cords away from us. These people have had ample opportunity to conform and submit to the messianic king. But their attitude is, we don't want to submit to anybody. We want to act as God. A role that Jehovah God does not allow humans to act in. Armageddon will remove all the rebels, squatters and vandals. But this raises a question. Why would human beings reject such a fair, righteous and just rulership under the messianic king, Jesus Christ? Why? The Bible answers. Let us go back to our Revelation chapter 16 and ask everyone to think seriously about something that on the surface may seem a little complex, but we're going to delve into it so as to gain understanding. Why do the nations of this earth take a stand against the messianic kingdom, that fair, just, righteous rulership? Well, we've already read, read verse 14, but to gain a complete understanding of it, we have to read it again, along with verse 13. Now, look carefully. John said, And I saw three unclean inspired expressions that looked like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the wild beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet they are in fact expressions inspired by demons and perform signs and they go forth to the kings of the entire inhabited earth to gather them together to the war of the great day of God the almighty so did we see why the people take their stand against Jehovah Verse 13 speaks about three unclean inspired expressions. One comes from the mouth of the dragon, one from the wild beast, and the last from the false prophet. So we have to understand what this is talking about to understand why people take a stand against Jehovah. So who is the dragon? Turn back to Revelation chapter 12 and we'll find out. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The identity of the dragon? John said, So down the great dragon was hurled, the original serpent, the one called Devil and Satan, who was misleading the entire inhabited earth. He was hurled down to the earth, and his angels were hurled down with him. So who was the dragon? It's the original serpent the one called devil and Satan. But do we see in which role he becomes the dragon? It's when he's misleading the entire inhabited earth. That's the dragon, Satan, in his role as misleader of the nations. So there's the identity of one party. How about the wild beast the Revelation 16 spoke about? Who is the wild beast? We'll just look across the page to chapter 13, and we'll have some pointers as to the identity of this beast in verses 1b and 2. Now, who is it? Let's work this out. And John said, And I saw a wild beast ascending out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, and upon its horns ten diadems, but upon its heads blasphemous names. Now, the wild beast that I saw was like a leopard, but its feet were as those of a bear, and its mouth was as a lion's mouth. And the dragon gave to the beast 
its power and its throne and great authority. So, so who is this wild beast? It's rather a freakish animal. It couldn't be a literal animal. We don't get wild beasts made up of part leopard, part bear, part lion. But those familiar with the scriptures will recognize that throughout the Bible, God has described political entities as being beasts. The book of Daniel is full of beasts that were political entities. And this likewise is one. We also know that scholars have pointed out that the word beast here literally conveys the idea of something that is a brute. It's something that is cruel, destructive, frightful, ravenous, a real monster. Now doesn't that well describe the blood-stained political system of this world? A political system that will not stop at destroying anyone or anything it can to keep power. I think it's quite amazing that these political entities even describe themselves as beasts. We have the British lion, the American eagle, the Russian bear, beast-like. This wild beast describes the entire political system by which Satan has dominated mankind. One more identity we need to work at. Who is the false prophet? Well, let's just turn over to chapter 13 and verses 11 through 13. And again, we have indicators as to the identity of the false prophet. And notice firstly in verse 11, it says, And I saw another wild beast, so another political entity, ascending out of the earth, but it had two horns like a lamb, but it began speaking as a dragon. And it exercises all the authority of the first wild beast in its sight. And it makes the earth and those who dwell in it worship the first wild beast whose death stroke God healed, and it performs great signs so that it should even make fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the sight of mankind. Right now, who is this false prophet, this wild beast, this political entity? Did we see verse 11? Two horns. Again, those familiar with the writings of the Bible book of Daniel will know that some of the political entities, some of the beasts back then had a number of horns. This indicates a partnership of two political powers, coexisting, independent, but fully cooperating. It says it has two horns like a lamb, though. Lamb? Oh, yes, this political entity makes itself out to be lamb-like, mild and inoffensive, speaking words of wisdom to which all other governments should turn to for enlightenment. But then it says it also begins speaking like a dragon. Oh yes, mild and inoffensive, as long as everyone cooperates with it. Anyone who disagrees, it will use threats and outright violence to get its way. Verse 13, it says it's performing great signs. Oh, this world power, this political entity feels it has adequate credentials as a prophet. This century alone. It claims to have vanquished the evil in two world wars. To have crushed so-called godless communism. To be the font of all good material things. The upholder of liberty for the benefit of all mankind. Who is the false prophet? The Anglo-American world power is the false prophet. So, now that we understand the identity of those three entities, let's go back to Revelation 16. Now, what is it that comes out of their mouth that misleads people? Well, it speaks about unclean, inspired expressions. And what are these unclean, inspired expressions? Well, it reminds us of the false statements made by false prophets in the past. These ones claim to represent the universal sovereign. They claim to be mouthpieces for Jehovah himself. But they do quite the opposite. They lead ones to take a stand against Jehovah. They've done so in the past, they're doing so here. 
unclean, inspired expressions, demonic propaganda designed to manipulate minds and mislead them to taking their stand against Jehovah. Now, how do we know that this process is taking place? Well, it all comes down to understanding how people generally view these three entities. And if we just turn back to Revelation 13, we can see how people view these three things. Look at verse 4. And there John said, and they, now that's speaking about the people in general, they worshipped the dragon because it gave the authority to the wild beast. And they worshipped the wild beast, the entire political system, remember, with the words, who is like the wild beast? And who can do battle with it? So there, John states that people generally worship the political system. Now, is that the case? Yes. Because people are quite willing to put loyalty to a political system above loyalty to Jehovah God. Prideful, patriotic worship of any part of this wild beast denotes worship of it. The thought, our country, right or wrong, is not a Christian teaching, never has been, never could be. And do people worship this this wild beast, this political entity today? Yes. Just think in our century, we have a, a horrendous example of worship of the wild beast. In the 1930s, very intelligent, highly educated people with access to God's word, the Bible, suddenly started acting in a terrible way towards other human beings. They started to push them into forced labor camps, to treat them like animals, to carry out horrendous medical experiments upon these ones. They starved them, they beat them, they tortured them. And after they'd had any use out of them, they put them into gas chambers and murdered them by the hundred of thousands. At the Nuremberg War Trial, what was the defense of these people? They stood up and they said, I was just obeying orders. They put loyalty to their political system above loyalty and obedience to Jehovah God. They had the Bible, but they rejected it because they worshipped not the God of the Bible, they worshipped their political system. And by doing so, who were they really worshipping? Who gave authority to this wild beast? Go back to verse 4. And there he says, And they worshipped the dragon, because it gave the authority to the wild beast. This is why we need Armageddon. Because on the surface, things might look quite acceptable. But using insight and the scriptures, we can see that behind the scenes, the one pulling the strings, the one manipulating, is Satan, the devil. He is misleading the entire inhabited earth. Now, we have to be careful that we don't get confused with that term, mislead. Because Jehovah God has given ample opportunity for ones to find out the truth. If ones are being misled, it is because they are choosing to be misled. We need Armageddon because it's the only way of Jehovah God vindicating his sovereignty. It's as the prophet Ezekiel says on a number of occasions, the nations will have to know that I am Jehovah. Oh, they won't like it. They try and ignore it. But it doesn't matter. They will have to know. Jehovah God is going to bring Armageddon because he will no longer tolerate evil. Also at that time he will clear his name of the terrible slander that's been spat up upon his name for centuries. Just think, our century... Ones t tell us that in excess of a hundred million people have died in wars this century. Some point out that if you take into consideration all armed insurrections and coups, etc., it's in excess of 360 million people. Now that's a lot of blood 
that's been spilt this century. A veritable lake of blood. And who gets the blame? When we go out in our Christian ministry and we speak about the Prince of Peace, one's often pushes away. They have in their mind mental pictures. History shows the blessing of the bayonets in the First World War, the blessing of the bombs in the Second World War, blessing of the machine guns of the flamethrowers. Why recently the Russian Orthodox Church has even blessed the nuclear arsenal of the Russian Confederation. So when these weapons are used, people think God is directing them. That is a thought that Satan has been drumming into people's minds for centuries. One side even had the audacity to go into battle in the Second World War with emblazoned on their uniform, God is with us. That is a slander and a lie that will be clarified at Armageddon. Jehovah will show he has never supported any of these governments. A major leap forward in justice at Armageddon. Also at that time, Jehovah will prevent the destruction of all mankind. Animals don't soil their nests. Human beings seem intent on killing the planet that we need to give us life. It goes in and out of fashion. Sometimes it's in the newspapers, sometimes it's not. But the fact is, at this very moment, whether it's in our newspapers or not, Men are pouring hundreds of thousands of tons of pollutants into the sea, the land, and the atmosphere. It cannot go on for much longer. The earth cannot take it. At Armageddon, Jehovah is going to save the planet. He's going to wipe out all these polluters, these vandals. Also at that time, Jehovah will do away with certain threats that come from the political system. Do we feel safe, knowing full well that at this very moment there is a conflict going on between two nuclear powers, one of which has stated quite openly that they will not hold back from using their nuclear weapons to defend themselves? Well, their use of the word defense is open to interpretation. The two powers, India and Pakistan. Pakistan has said it will use its nuclear weapons. Could that spark something off? Do you find that the world's political scene is stable and inspires confidence? Do we like the idea that at this moment in the Middle East, there is a political power that has demonstrated its ability to construct biological weapons and even has used those biological weapons against their own people? destroying life in huge tracts of land. Does that inspire confidence? That threat will go at Armageddon. Jehovah will wipe out all these things in one blow. Armageddon is in complete harmony with Jehovah's principal attributes. Justice. Would it be just for Jehovah to hold back and allow mankind to torture each other for eternity? No. Would it be wise for Jehovah to hold back while men continue to pollute the planet? No. How about Jehovah's quality of power? Oh, the nations strut around as if they're gods. At Armageddon, their puny power will be shown in comparison with that of the almighty universal sovereign. He will firmly establish the government that he knows is the only rightful one to have dominion over the planet. Christ will exercise his God-given authority and execute all those who refuse to support God's kingdom. We need Armageddon. Without it, there's no future, no earth, no human life. But we know why we need it. We're interested in when it's going to come. What are the events that lead up to Armageddon? The Bible clearly reveals a considerable number of things that have already taken place. For instance, in Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 12, it speaks about a conflict in heaven 
when Satan and his demonic hordes were cast out to the vicinity of the earth because the kingdom was established at that time, 1914. Oh yes, it meant woe for the earth, short term, but long term, it means blessings for mankind. Now Jehovah's Witnesses have printed reams of material clearly showing that the sign of the last days is being completed around us. One part of that sign, for instance, Jesus said the good news of God's kingdom must be preached in the entire inhabited earth. In excess of 230 lands have had an extensive preaching campaign carried out in them. That sign is near complete fulfillment. But what is to come? We've seen lots of things happen behind us. But what is to come? Well, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 16 speaks about an attack on the world empire of false religion, Babylon the Great. That will spark off the start of the great tribulation that Jesus Christ spoke about. In the great tribulation, we will see the sign of the Son of Man. Then God's gathering of his chosen ones. And finally, Jesus Christ, the enthroned king, will complete his conquest. That is the day of Armageddon. Between Babylon's destruction and Armageddon, Satan will make one last final, desperate, frenzied attack against Jehovah's people. Just think of it from his point of view. By that time, he will have misled everyone bar Jehovah's faithful witnesses. It will drive him mad. Our spiritual prosperity, a spiritual paradise, and he can't do anything about it. He'll lash out and attack us, but Jehovah God guarantees that as soon as he does, he will step in and protect us. That will be the very climax of Jehovah's fear-inspiring day. That will be Armageddon. And what would it be like? Well, the Bible contains a number of indicators. For instance, it speaks about Jehovah using natural means, flooding cloudbursts, devastating hailstones, streaking fire. Deadly pestilence will reign worldwide. Panic will be everywhere. People will be fighting each other on the streets of Cumbernauld. It's not a matter of leaning forward and turning over onto a different channel. We cannot escape it. A global situation. Any who survive that time will be executed. At Armageddon, Jehovah will wipe out all remaining vandals, all those who are corrupt, all those who are using this world to the full and therefore support it and worship the dragon. And please note, he will also wipe out all those who are too lazy to help others. That is a considerable number of people who will not be allowed to go through and make up the New World Society. Are we going to be amongst those who survive? Only if we stay awake. Let's just remind ourselves of something in Revelation 16 that we have not read as of yet. Now we've read in Revelation 16 verses 13, 14 and 16. We know why Armageddon's coming. Satan's there pulling the strings. There's no life, no existence without it. But notice what Jesus Christ interjected in these thoughts in verse 15, where he said, Look, I am coming as a thief. Happy is the one that stays awake and keeps his outer garments, that he may not walk naked and people look upon his shamefulness. It's a strange thought to many that Jesus describes himself as coming as a thief. But that is a common phrase when it comes to God's day. For instance, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, it says, Jehovah's day is coming exactly as a thief in the night. 
Matthew 24, verses 42 and 44, Jesus said, Keep on the watch, therefore, because you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. On this account, you too prove yourselves ready, because, and please note, at an hour that you do not think it to be, the Son of Man is coming. Thief. A thief makes no announcement of the time of his arrival. There will be no announcement of a date of Armageddon in any newspaper, television program. It won't be in our magazines. In fact, the Bible indicates that we will receive no further information than the information we now have at hand. There is no need for any more information. We have sufficient to take our stand. However, there are some who have put about their own thoughts that could be misleading. And we want to clarify a few of those right now. So let's open our Bibles this time to Revelation 18. And we're going to read verses 7 and 8 to clarify a misunderstanding. A little bit of background. Well, this is speaking about Babylon the Great, that world empire of false religion. Now, some have wondered and openly stated that as Babylon the Great fell in the sense of no longer having complete dominion over all human beings in 1919, when Jehovah brought out a spiritual remnant of Israelite, virtual Israelite, they have reasoned, well, as it fell in 1919, by the time the nations turn on it at the start of the Great Tribulation, it'll basically be on its last legs, ready to topple over, a non-entity in effect. Look at chapter 18 of Revelation, and verses 7 and 8, where it states, to the extent that she, that world empire of false religion, glorified herself and lived in shameless luxury, to that extent, give her torment and mourning. For in her heart she keeps saying, I sit a queen, and I am no widow, and I shall never see mourning. That is why in one day her plagues will come. Death and mourning and famine and she will be completely burned with fire because Jehovah God who judged her is strong will Babylon the great the world empire of false religion be on its last legs when Armageddon comes no according to that in her heart in verse 7 she will genuinely feel that she's immortal I sit a queen I am no widow, I shall never see mourning, and then the nations will wipe it out. In fact, there are strong indicators that it's when Babylon the Great is trying to influence to the greatest degree ever that the nations will crush it. So don't expect Babylon to be a non-entity. It will be very vocal and then Armageddon, or then the start of the Great Tribulation. So don't be put off by what we see. There are strong indicators that Armageddon is about to come. Those familiar with the Bible book of Daniel will know that it contains all sorts of prophecies, many of which have been completely fulfilled by some important concluding details. The prophecy concerning the King of the North and the King of the South, now we know that the identity of these two kings has changed throughout history, but we now know the identity of one of those kings that will be destroyed at Armageddon. One more identity is yet to come. Both kings are removed, destroyed, executed at Armageddon. There's not a great deal more of that prophecy to be fulfilled, and it will be fulfilled rapidly. We also need to be very careful that we don't misinterpret our own situation as Jehovah's Christian witnesses. Some have made statements, well, the preaching activity has yet to go into certain lands. Ones are speaking about China and saying, well, it's not fair that Jehovah bring Armageddon before these people have a witness. Well, that is an assumption on a number of different reasons. 
Firstly, we in this country are not parlay to the amount of witnessing that takes place in China. We don't know. We're not told. But there is a preaching work taking place in that country. And if Jehovah God opens the doors so that we go charging in and we carry out an extensive preaching campaign, well, that's his will. We will do it. But Jesus Christ indicates that certain places will not be reached. Notice what he said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 23. Matthew 10 and verse 23. Now concerning the worldwide preaching work, Jesus Christ was saying here, when they persecute you in one city, flee to another. For truly I say to you, you will by no means complete the circuit of the cities of Israel until the Son of Man arrives. So if we are persecuted in one country or another, and not allowed to have open free witnessing take place, what does Jesus tell us to do? flee to another city the people will have to accept their responsibility for suppressing the kingdom good news that's not our responsibility that's something they will have to shoulder and notice then Jesus Christ states that we will by no means complete the circuit of the cities we will not get to every place in person The Bible really speaks about the good news of God's kingdom being announced throughout the earth. There is no indicator that every human being will receive a personal witness. In fact, there Jesus Christ says we won't. The fact now that we are getting to the point of saturating the earth with the kingdom good news, when Jesus Christ said we wouldn't, indicates that Armageddon is a lot closer than some think. The the arrival of the Great Tribulation will find our preaching work at the very peak of its momentum throughout the earth. We will be surprised when it comes. Another indicator that's been misunderstood by some is that that's mentioned in Revelation 7, 1 and 3, which speaks about the four winds of destruction being held back until after the sealing of the slaves of God in their foreheads. Now, that's not talking about the initial sealing of these ones when they receive their heavenly calling as anointed ones. That's referring to the final sealing. When it is publicized that these ones are genuine anointed sons of God. Please note, the number of genuine anointed sons of God on the earth at this moment is greatly diminished please don't be misled by figures we record the number of those who partake of the emblems we do not record the number of genuine anointed sons of God Jehovah selects not us these ones are quite elderly and yet Jesus stated clearly that some would be on the earth at the start of the great tribulation in Matthew 24 verse 22 speaking of that time he said in fact unless those days were cut short no flesh would be saved but note but on account of the chosen ones the anointed sons of God those days will be cut short remember the number of genuine anointed sons of God is greatly diminished. Another point that's been misinterpreted by some concerns the state of the political system when Armageddon strikes. Some have wondered, well, as political nations are getting to grips with certain long-term festering sores, for instance the problems in Northern Ireland, the problems in the Middle East. Surely they're stronger now than ever. And surely the Bible says these also will be on their last legs when Armageddon strikes. No, it doesn't. Look at Revelation 19 and verses 19 and 20. The indicators are that political nations will not be on their last legs 
Notice what it says in verses 19 and 20. And I saw the wild beast, remember the entire political system, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage the war with the one seated on the horse, Jesus Christ, and his army. And the wild beast was caught, and along with it the false prophet, the Anglo-American world power, that performed in front of it the signs with which he misled those who received the mark of the wild beast and those who render worship to its image while still alive they both were hurled into the fiery lake that burns with sulfur so will the political system be on its last legs well according to verse 19 they will still be able to draw up battle lines against God which they will do at that time. To do so, they will need to be organized to be able to communicate with each other. Not dead, but fully functioning. That's why it said in verse 20, while still alive, they were hurled into the fiery lake that burns with sulfur. While fully functioning, the political system will be wiped out. Following this, Satan will be abyssed and then blessings will start to come to obedient mankind. But remember, we have to stay awake. Some are just drifting away. Don't think the day of Armageddon is a long way off. It is right in front of us. To benefit from it, we have to keep the right attitude and do certain things. Now the Bible clearly points out what Jehovah requires of us. And we're going to ask everyone now to turn to the book of Zephaniah. Because in a nutshell, Zephaniah explains what Jehovah God requires. In fact, the book of Zephaniah, as we received at our convention, has a great deal to say about Jehovah's day. For instance, chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The great day of Jehovah is near, it is near, and there is a hurrying of it, very much. But to survive, let's focus our attention on Zephaniah chapter 2, and verses 2 and 3, where Zephaniah said, Before the statute gives birth to anything, before the day is passed by just like chaff. Before there comes upon you people the burning anger of Jehovah. Before there comes upon you the day of Jehovah's anger. Seek Jehovah. All you meek ones of the earth who have practiced his own judicial decision. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. Probably you may be concealed in the day of Jehovah's anger. So what do we do with our time? Did we see the word seek? He didn't say stumble across Jehovah or fit Jehovah God in when we've got a spare minute here or there. He said seek him. An active, positive pushing of ourselves to find Jehovah. And how do we find him? We find him in his word, the Bible. We study it personally and also with others at Christian meetings such as this, where God's word is opened up and explained. No doubt, for instance, there are questions concerning the material we've discussed today. Don't allow, don't allow those questions to go unanswered. Research themselves. We've got a marvelous library here that will go into completely the identification of the wild beast, the false prophet, any questions we have can be answered, but are we willing to seek him? We must to survive. We need to gain friendship with Jehovah by meeting his requirements, and we'll never meet them if we don't know what they are. Also, it says, seek righteousness. Now, that's interesting, because the world today has its own ideas of what's acceptable and what's not, its own standard. That standard is way below Jehovah's standards. We have to know what Jehovah God says is right or wrong and conform to that. We have to live our lives in harmony with what he states is acceptable and what is not acceptable. 
And also he said, seek meekness. This world is full of people who are so haughty that even if you look them right in the eye and with the utmost sincerity point out what they personally need to do to benefit themselves, they still turn away from it because you said it. That's haughtiness, not for Christians. We have to be soft, pliable in Jehovah's hands. Seek meekness, be humble, accept divine direction through the channel that he uses to maneuver us into a place of safety at Armageddon. But, did we see when we should be seeking these things? There is a word used four times in verse 2. Look for it. Because there he said, before the statute gives birth to anything, before the day is passed by, just like chaff. Before there comes upon you people the burning anger of Jehovah. Before there comes upon you the day of Jehovah's anger. Don't go to sleep. Stay awake and act wisely now. If we do so, then we could be amongst those who look forward to Armageddon. Remember, a grand future awaits all who survive that time. What excitement we are going to feel in the near future when Jehovah God brings the wiping out of all the pains and the sufferings that have cursed mankind for centuries. We can have all that if we act wisely. No one will fluke existence in the new world. Please, stay awake. Seek Jehovah, seek meekness, seek righteousness, draw close to God, and then we can be survivors of the real Armageddon.